Ace Combat 4 Shattered Skies, or Distant Thunder in Europe, was an exclusive title for the PlayStation 2's launch year. It's an arcade flight simulator with responsive but weighty controls and slow but hectic plane combat action. It's difficult to express to another person why it's such a valuable use of their time, and it's a hard game specifically to pinpoint its charm. The same can generally be said of the rest of the series. Though not the first game in its series, and technically not the first in the universe or canon, it marks a separation from the PlayStation 1 trilogy by taking more inspiration from near-historic western wars, rather than what was at the time contemporary anime. It also distinguishes itself in terms of approach to storytelling, though maintaining a trope from Ace Combat 3 of playing with the protagonist's perspective. These two distinctions follow us through a quaint second trilogy in the series, proceeding with Ace Combat 4. This would be the first game to use birds as a metaphor for pilots and concepts. The seagull is shown here heroically, mirroring a certain airplane, hinted to be the main character of the game. To introduce us to this trilogy, we're greeted by a short cutscene from the perspective of an unknown narrator in past tense. The first glimpse we have into this universe is when he was a young boy, in a very homely Western European world with obvious anime influences. It is painted out with antiquated and folky watercolouring. He explains poetically that a cannon was created to shoot down the stars that fall from the sky, and that the same cannon also seemed to create war. It's to set up a tragic irony at the end of the cutscene, when a plane covered in flames falls from the sky, somewhat like a falling meteor, killing his parents. The reality of war is literally brought home, and it leaves a very morbid thought. In the face of apocalypse, humanity might well band together, but once it's all over, they're straight back at each other's throats. This begins the young boy's revenge narrative, as he looks for the yellow 13 plane that accidentally left him an orphan. We then are pushed into an entirely different aesthetic. It almost seems like another time and place. The play is briefed on the dire situation of the war between the independent Uzian states and Arusia, across the entire Uzian continent. Arusia has won over most ground, given they have the Shrine of Railguns nicknamed Stonehenge. They can shoot down asteroids and redirect them, giving them near total air superiority over the continent. The first mission takes place over the circular crater that instigated Stonehenge's creation. Though not immediately relevant, there's an interesting detail that they've begun building ports into it already. We're welcomed by a quote that will only become important in retrospect. Amidst the blue skies, a link from past to future, the sheltering wings of the Protector. It's only five minutes in and you're already getting prepared for the cockpit. Ace Combat 4 goes straight to the action skipping the handholding. Though, admittedly for the first mission you're put into an open sky with very few optional hostiles. And it's just to get the feel for the air combat. There's some meek targets as well, just to get your feet wet. It's a deceptively simple game. It's an easy mistake to assume the game is too simple, even. One of the three weapons is the machine gun. It fires where your plane is focused, and accounting for drop makes it unreliable. As the least damaging weapon, it can be fired without cooldown. The second is the primary missiles, which are heat-seeking. It requires you to keep the enemy within a certain distance of the cone of vision of your cockpit. In spite of the game's attention to detail, the plane somehow carries between 40 to 60 of them. Finally, you have the alternate weapon. The alternate weapon can be changed out before a mission, and replaces your primary missiles when activated. These range from unguided bombs you drop with a wide area of effect, to heat seekers that can lock onto multiple targets and fire in unison. Though the player can buy different planes and weapons, their capabilities never evolve much. It's just the efficiency of their gameplay. That said, when you do buy a new plane, it's hard not to feel the extra power throwing you around. And that's it. It's almost underwhelmingly simple, and yet the gameplay in action is somewhat hypnotic. Getting tailed and pulling a loop up behind the enemy to get a beat on their tail is satisfying. Evading enemy missiles in the nick of time is exciting. The game seems to encourage the player to flirt with death of their own volition and pulling off dangerous stunts. Because the movement of the plane is mapped to the stick like an actual flight stick, the one-to-one -one feel with the plane means all the action is in your hands, and it really is just you and your skill. As an example, if you aim your nose at the ground, the game won't correct you to prevent your crash. Unlike a few contemporary action games, there's no dedicated dodge or chaff mechanic. Evasion is entirely manual. The interplay of the lock-on conditions, depending on the direction of your plane, 
and evasive maneuvers requiring you to shift your nose can lead to some risk taking as you're desperate to get your shot off in time. Fortunately, the scenario of the game is diverse enough to get blood from the stone of a simulationist control scheme. By putting almost ultimate power over the plane in the player's hands, they're also giving the player the ultimate responsibility of that. The game's map, which is seen before every mission, gives a good visual impression of the situation you're in without much speech. Stonehenge has a circle of air dominance around almost the entire continent. Another unexpected part of the charm of this series is that even the briefing screens can get you pumped and ready to play. As a running baseline, as a memorable motif, and as a very stylish presentation. It can be difficult to make a briefing screen something you want to sit through. Very few games can do it. Many try and fail. Some of the secret likely has to do with how succinct they are in Ace Combat. But I wouldn't be afraid of saying that most of it is the aesthetic. After the flashback, it's Mission 2. The player, revealed on the last mission to have the call sign Mobius 1, is hitting their first base. This is another case where it sounds relatively simple, but it's not doubtless that many new players will crash during this mission, because of the type of flying necessary to hit grounded planes. Locking onto the ground targets, using basic missiles, requires a downward trajectory, and whilst decelerating can buy you some well-needed time, not paying attention to this may stall the engine. Contact with the ground is death, which should be avoided. To help slow players adjust, your CO recommends using the power lines on the ground to help you navigate. Keeping them in sight whilst not crashing is good practice before also having to shoot. It's a subtle tutorial which in no way bothers repeat players. But it could be all the help in the world to people not very familiar with video games. There's even a target in the midst of the power lines as a nice reward. The mandatory targets are in tight bunches, so using an unguided bomb to turf the ground is a viable option too. This is an example of how the scenario design can push players to make tactical decisions based on their briefing and encourage different types of play. It's not something you think about when you're playing, but the moment to moment gameplay is very protracted. If you're playing well, there's a lot of planning that goes into your approach, and ideally interactions with targets are brief. A lot of the gameplay takes place outside of the actual attack. It's interesting how the limitations of a plane's aerodynamics based maneuverability makes the act of travelling to a target 10 seconds away so interesting. Just as these missions begin to get a routine going, at mission 5 you have a prolonged score based goal. Until now it's been about eliminating targets, but this mission becomes a lot more freeform, with targets of different values wandering about. The game probably doesn't allow too many of these because a lot of the game's freeform decision making depends on how much money you've earned in a mission in order to buy planes or weapons or such. At the end of this mission there's a twist. The Yellow Squadron has come to salvage the situation, though they're a little bit too late. That includes Yellow 13. Although the scenario is unwinnable and you're told to evacuate a base, you're allowed to try and fight the Yellow Squadron. But no matter how fast you move or how guaranteed you think your lock-on is, they'll always just about dodge your missiles. The magic of this moment is that it's all in the player's hands, like all great plot moments of the game. Even though this is pretty much a scripted sequence and it's entirely in Yellow's favour, the scenario does add a lot more to the plot and I'd call it a strength of the game. The few short cutscenes until now have introduced our narrator, who's now wearing an adult-sized high-vis jacket around his tiny self. He explains how his situation's changed. The events don't particularly interest him though because of the single-minded revenge and all that. He says he's always looking up to the sky looking for Yellow 13 again. If it weren't obvious already, a theme of the game is how war looks from both sides. Not necessarily between ally and enemy factions, but between soldiers and civilians. The narrator was living with his uncle, playing the harmonica to the occupation at the local bar for cash in order to pay for his uncle's alcoholism. The uncle was at some point a taxi driver, but now fuel is rationed and the uncle is out of the job. The narrator lists other lifestyle changes, such as language, a lack of television, traveling via horse and cart despite the time period, it gives a good excuse for the almost World War II aesthetic of these visuals, but obviously it's more about how the war, which wasn't caused by the young boy, has effectively ruined almost all aspects of his life. And speaking of ruined lives, soon enough we meet our man. The introduction to 13 has just about as much charm as the opening cutscene. He's spoken of by other pilots as a legend, 64 kills to that day. 
the man who killed the young lad's parents and 64 allies would otherwise be portrayed as a monster. But our protagonist's narrative of revenge is muddied by Yellow 13 as he plays the boy's late father's favourite song and he asks him to play along on harmonica. This reinforces the connection between the boy and 13, reminding us why he's now an orphan. But it also shows 13's not as two-dimensional as it seems from the ground. You're forced to reconsider 13 without hearing a word from his mouth. In fact, he's not much of a villain at all. He has a lot of heart. His pride lies in not losing any wingmen, rather than his kill count. And the narrator describes the man as having compassion for his weaker enemies. If that weren't enough, when the narrator is abandoned by his slob of an uncle, 13 gives a home to him among his crew. At every opportunity, the narrator takes a moment to ridicule himself for his inaction or his immaturity at the time. To be fair to him, it's unavoidable. A kid like that can't be older than seven based on his appearance. And he's ultimately very powerless, and he relates most of this in every cutscene as a self-criticism. It lends his character some humanity. Telling it as a flashback and focusing on regrets makes the story more about the narrator than the events around him, and using his experience is a good window to become invested into the world around it. It's somewhat counterintuitive, but it does work. He contrasts himself with the barkeep and the barkeep's daughter. The narrator admits to having a crush on the latter. They're heading the resistance operations in town, secretly collecting intel at the bar in the face of criticism for their service to their new patrons. Even now, whilst finding an example of true heroism, the narrator also finds a way to belittle himself once again. But that was only because of my tender age. The barkeep and his family were the real heroes, while I, on the other hand, found a haven among the enemy. Whilst it's one thing to say that Ace Combat has fantastic music, just saying that is selling it short. The use of classical Spanish guitar adds a somber air of regret filling the narrator's life. He's rather constantly abandoned and without home, getting pitied by everyone around him. That all these songs are solos is likely a reflection upon that. It's a lonely life. To further show distinction between the game's cutscenes and gameplay, most of the songs in the gameplay are filled with very techno-oriented sounds. The songs used for plane purchasing and plane selection for missions are highly technical songs. All the overarching chords are moved to the background to allow the low bass to the forefront and the keyboard to take center stage. It's not uncommon for video game music especially to add layers of intricate instrumentation to try and give the impression of a situation being a little bit more cerebral. My final example is more of a trend, as it's not every song, but many of them. As soon as you take to the sky, the drums take the lead, adding a pace to the flight. Flight itself isn't something that naturally has a fast pace, especially given the simulationist control scheme. Even in a jet going max speed, it's deceptively calm. Having not necessarily high beats per minute, but a focused drum line reframes the gliding into a kind of tension before a storm. After the drumbeat has had some time to set in, an orchestral or electronic slow melody covers the drumbeat. Though the drumbeat would otherwise hide the freedom and serenity of the gliding, the scores bring it all back as though that's what it's all about. Usually this melody comes in at roughly the time you begin or are in deep engagement with the first or second enemy. But, there's also more generally tense, heart-pounding songs like the ones in Mission 6 and Mission 8. Mission 6 is the Invincible Fleet. It's the Mobius team's task to sink the Invincible Aegir Fleet while still docked. It's a tactical decision. At first, it's kind of unsuspecting how easy it is to sink each ship, but the sheer number of targets will begin to dawn on the player as they go through the mission. Each key ship is named and totals about 13 vessels including submarines, aircraft carriers, and battleships. It's a simplistic mission admittedly, but canonically it's the difference between life and death for the entire war. Although the initial missions seemed irrelevant, this mission has more of a readily understandable context. Whilst the enemies are stationary, they still fire back from their cannons, and many submarines are sheltered in large water-bound hangars, so it's not exactly shooting ducks in a barrel. 
you might even need to break off to attack some enemy fighters. It does a lot for the mission that as you arrive the fleet is already attempting to escape to water, and even the end mission untagged ships will eventually attempt to set sail. Once the mission's over, there's a moment of camaraderie for the attack that would begin the legend of the fighter known as Mobius I. The Mobius Squadron breaks into the Hymn of Freedom, the Uzian National Anthem. Which is strange because Uzia is a continent, not a nation. The landmass contains a collection of completely independent states with the Federal Republic of Arusia up in the northwest. The independent states within Uzia co-created the independent state allied forces to combat Arusia's takeover of the continent. The continent. I suppose it's possible they'd share an anthem given that it's assumed all the states contained within the landmass were relatively free republics and democracies. Well, for now anyway. Mission 8 is the eponymous Shattered Skies. It's a favourite among fans for its soundtrack, scenario and its concept. It's a satellite deployment for the Allied Forces' recon effort. The Erusians are intercepting the launch. The player is tasked with defending the launch in order to ensure future intelligence, and the result is a large-scale dogfight, plane versus plane. The music is rocking and metallic from the start. You begin only seconds away from a proper confrontation. It's instant action. This is a perfect opportunity for me to talk about the title of the game. In the US and Japan, the game is labelled Shattered Skies. It's a description of a dogfight from the outside perspective. Contrails from a third dimensional perspective, a la the ribbon motif of the results screen, look like a hairball. And large scale dogfights have actually gotten named as such in reality. But from afar, from the ground level, where the sky itself is just the background to everyday life, a dogfight looks more like cracks along a glass dome. Hence the clever terminology, a shattered sky. It's also a good descriptor for air superiority based war. The European name of the game is Ace Combat Distant Thunder. It achieves the same effect. From an outside perspective, the most distinctive feel is the sound of the fighter jets achieving various mock speeds whilst fighting each other. The cracking sound of sound barriers being broken is not unlike the sound of thunder in the distance. Despite Ace Combat 4's other regional censorship, I believe that this is an instance where both regional titles for the game effectively convey a large theme for the narrative and game narrative. Immediately in the mission you're getting reports that friendly fighters are being shot down by yellows. It's your first sign of the significance of the mission. There's an enemy on radio with a new distinctive voice. On radar there's roughly eight enemies profiled in dark orange, showing their higher value targets from others if you can see them through the 24 or so other planes in a tight knot on the radar. I feel like a broken record, but the scenario and the music really do make the scene. The mission's entirely dependent on the timer, and the amount of fighters you shoot down has a lower limit which is undefined. The player in this knot can opt to try their luck with the yellow forces once again, and whilst it's difficult, it's possible to tag one of them this time. If you do manage it, the yellow radio goes off in confusion asking who hit them, and they promptly exit stage left. Your radio buddies even commend you for it. As subdued as the commendation is, because it's optional, there's every reason to feel empowered by this. It's a fine example of narrative told through gameplay. At first, you couldn't even land a hit on one of them. Now you can barely catch one of the tails with a missile, and you almost feel like it's a crowning achievement. Whilst it's admittedly semi-scripted, because the game doesn't serenade the player, there's an ironic affirmation of the player's accomplishment as it's not seemingly predetermined, and therefore it's making it all the sweeter. This may be a good time for me to bring up the radio in detail. It's got two primary roles. You get feedback during gameplay, and there's five good examples I can think of. The distance and relative angle of enemies. When you chase down enemies, they complain. Then when the enemies chase you down, they express their intent. When they fire missiles at you, your comrades tell you to evade, and when you shoot them down, you hear them panic. That final note is important. Hearing your enemy be unable to save themselves due to your actions on its face is quite horrific, but it's also a fantastic way of showing you've achieved victory. The way it makes me feel is usually successful, but that feeling isn't nearly sadistic or psychopathic. It's more like a definitive and diegetic way of showing that you've achieved your goal. The second role the radio has is to impart the game's narrative and scenario. 
You receive orders, and you hear scripted enemy and friendly dialogue about the situation or their intentions. In this particular mission, the pace at which the radio is going mad is very encouraging and exciting. The friendly fighters are complaining about the issues of the chaos, and the enemy fighters are complaining about the effect of the friendly forces. It carries the gameplay sections and fills dead time with suspense. The running theme of my commentary is that there's so many otherwise disparate elements that, when removed or isolated, they might leave the game completely uncompelling and a mess. When you put all of them together, they're worth vastly more than the individual components alone. This mission's interrupted by a bombing squad once enough time has passed. As a test of if you've properly dealt with the initial forces, attacking the bombers is naturally more difficult if you haven't taken down many planes, so it acts as a kind of soft test of your skills. At the end of the mission, you can actually watch the rocket launch. It's one of the many advantages of the perspective of a pilot. Although it is possible to miss it if you're not around or you are not savvy enough to look in the right direction. The disadvantage of trying to tell a narrative through gameplay is that the player can, and will, unwittingly miss or fail to participate. There's every chance the mission could fall flat if someone simply didn't attack the Yellow Squadron or didn't watch the rocket launch. But managing to do either or both of these things make your initial playthrough feel somewhat like it's your own. Maybe that's the double-edged sword of video games entirely as a medium. As previously mentioned, the ribbon motif of the results screen is a wonder to behold in most missions. But this one in particular takes the piss. The sheer quantity is overwhelming, and the difference between a typical mission and a true out-and-out -out dogfight is obvious. These results screens are a brilliant addition. They're mesmerizing. I find myself watching with anticipation, getting flashes of memory. This is about where I hit the yellow, I think, to myself. Some people who've played Ace Combat 4 may be confused as to why I'm suggesting that our younger protagonist is on a revenge story path. And this is because all non-Japanese versions of the game are censored. In the Japanese version, there's a still and a line where the narrator says that he'd stolen two weapons with the intent of killing Yellow 13. Two years prior to release, there was a rather infamous shooting at Columbine High School in America. The image and concept of a child holding an offensive weapon would be very sensitive at the time in America. The effort of the censorship even goes so far as redrawing frames of the child, which only imply that he has a weapon from his body language. Whilst I can appreciate the decision to make Ace Combat 4 as successful as possible in the West, it came at the expense of the game's legacy, the potency of its narrative, and therefore its living memory even today. A choice made to ease the game's launch has left PAL and NTSCU regions with not only an inferior product, but an arguably incomplete one. It's just fortunate that the game only has an English dub. Anyway, with regards to the plot, the boy could never actually manage to approach 13 due to Yellow 4's presence, his wingman Et, and the only other stable member of the Yellow Squadron. The cutscene sets up 4's place very succinctly by not giving her much more than an implied character by a gentle demeanour and implying other characters are afraid of her. The barkeep's daughter, for instance, was jealous of how very close Yellow 4 and 13 are, having developed a crush on him herself. The narrator never mentions how disheartening this probably is. He's well and truly forced into the role of the Observer once again, and it also gives him another reason to hate 13. The writing makes Yellow 4 a fearsome figure, despite doing no direct wrongs simply because of 13's aloof presence as well. All he seems to care about is a mysterious enemy pilot. Mission 9, Bunker Shot. Another score attack mission with bombers at the end. I don't think the mission has a lot going on really, but I have to make note that there's going to be a few missions like this that I have to leave out to consolidate into other, later missions. They typically only serve the purpose of expanding the legend of Mobius 1 by having him take on larger and larger tasks. To do that here, the game takes on imagery from the landing of Normandy, changing what was an abysmal storming of a French beachfront into something that actually went pretty well. Well, if the play is good enough anyway. Mission 10, Tango Line. In an earlier Mission 7, what seems like a routine bombing run results in Stonehenge carpet bombing the airspace. You get to see the cannon's power firsthand and how it can somehow remove anything from the sky above 2,000 feet you're forced to retreat through a rather large valley out of the area. Stonehenge is a set of eight railguns, and the shells themselves are designed to destroy comets. 
So having remotely detonatable explosive shells isn't too unthinkable, but it's left to the player's imagination for how it's possible to completely remove the airspace above 2,000 feet. After some hefty victories, your team makes a daring mission back under the umbrella of Stonehenge. It's intermittently laying down for covering fire for the research bases in the area of the Tango Line. There's a rather rocky topology that requires you to go above the 2,000 foot instant death threshold in order to destroy some of the targets. It shows the scenario has really begun to further its trust in the player. The topology can also let you avoid SAMs and AA guns, which are positioned atop mountains by risking flying within the mountain rifts. It's one of the better designed 3D areas of the game. This is also where a rather considerable complaint comes with how punishing the game can be. Many missions run up to, if not exceed, 20 minutes of gameplay, entirely without any checkpoints. Mission objectives can change within that time. You could be put up against intentionally impossible odds at the end of a mission, and you decide to take your chances, which turn out to be none. You could be ducking and diving between mountains, and if your angle isn't just right, it can mean instant death. And if you die, it's all the way back to the start of your mission. The planes you'll be using too on a fresh run are very fragile. They'll only be able to take about two or three missile hits, and artillery fire can chip significant portions of your health off. You can at least try and fix this by wasting some time flying back to the resupply zone. During this mission in particular, your altitude could go over 2,000 feet at just the wrong time just before you complete the mission, and you'd be instantly annihilated. The punishment from Stonehenge seems a bit too harsh. It's mostly not a problem because it's well telegraphed over radio, and to argue the perspective of the narrative, if you're caught in it, you instantly understand why this cannon gives the Erusian forces complete air dominance. But on the odd occasions that this cannon has caught me, and including my memory of my first tries at playing the game as a youngling, it's been very demotivating to see much effort simply vanish. That said, when you do accomplish yourself in these rougher scenarios, things go very right. The next mission also concerns Stonehenge, and has a nod back to Ace Combat 2 with a special guest. There's no covering fire this time, but you're escorting a civilian airplane being ambushed by fighters. There's an informant on board who helped build Stonehenge. It's a pretty basic mission, and it kind of feels tacked on for reference to an older title, but it's a good opportunity for me to complain further. Your friendly pilots in the game don't really do much. They occasionally steal kills from you, and sometimes they even get in the way of the enemy, but by and large, it's up to the player to win the fights. It's a blessing and a curse. The player is given more game to play, but sometimes the guy who sounds like Sulu over the radio will berate you for your sloppy flying when everyone else is acting like they're on autopilot, and it can begin to feel very artificial. There's two ways to look at this. Either everyone else is terrible, or... Mobius-1 is an incredible pilot. In a follow-up cutscene, Yellow 4 gets hurt by a local resistance attack on the runway. It destroys vital supplies and also damages Yellow 4's plane. It's suggested to be led by the Tavern Rebels of the story, and it's later outright stated, but the reason Yellow 4 was targeted specifically was because of the barkeep's daughter's jealousy. Yellow 13 is shown in still frames rescuing a puppy, as if you needed any more evidence of 13's nature. The dog's been following the protagonist around since the beginning, it's never narrated upon at all. Its place in the story is non-existent, it's a cute footnote that adds a great detail in the scenes. Perhaps it's a strange attempt at an animal mascot, or some kind of pun on dog fighting. During this cutscene, the report of an attack on Stonehenge comes in, and the Yellows scramble. Yellow 4 takes flight without any missiles, possibly to alleviate her engine troubles. The next mission briefing reveals that you're the one attacking Stonehenge, and only at this point does the game make it fully explicit that the narrator and Mobius 1 are not the same people. I'm going to have to word this carefully, because I'm not saying the game's written with this intent. But it's not uncommon, and I'd say under 10% of the time, a player's first experience would be to make the assumption that Mobius 1 and the narrator may be the same person in two different time frames. Now, there's plenty of obvious clues, but... The narrator speaks entirely in past tense, and the contemporary, quote-unquote, classical architecture and the vehicles don't really show up when you're in the air because of the low terrain detail of the PlayStation 2 modeling. If it seemed like I'd been avoiding mentioning this until now, you're right. I do wonder if it's a fault of the narrative that a mistake like this is possible, 
or if there was some intent to make it seem like the narrator would one day grow up to become Mobius I. Now, whilst this does fit into the rest of my reading, I'll just assume that this is a mistake that idiots only make. I don't really want to be contentious. I'll return to the separation between cutscene and gameplay later on. The Stonehenge attack is difficult. Even the briefing said there was a 40% expected casualty rate for friendlies. For some reason, the mythical 8 cannon structure is 7 cannons in the game. It may have been an issue with rendering them along with the defense fighters, or it could be a reference to the actual British monument's incomplete nature. Your lock-on is jammed until you can figure out where the jammer is and shoot it down. Or you're left to manually bomb and shoot down all seven cannons surrounded by SAMs and AA guns without any lock-on. Thankfully, the mission is brief, and given the likelihood of your death, it's not too much of an issue to start over. Each of the cannons is also made up of three sub-targets. The player's choice of weapon can really change how the mission plays in particular. The latest plane you can buy through the slow unlock scheme comes default with an incredibly powerful air-to-ground missile, and it's rewarding to players who can actually afford it at this point. Once you've felled four of them, the enemy fighters take notice and determine Mobius I, the Ribbon, as their primary target. Your friendly fighters also comment that you're stealing the glory. Perhaps it's canonical that your teammates are useless, or maybe it's just how the legend of Mobius I begins. There's a brief celebration to a successful mission having freed the aerial movement over all of Uzia. This is something that will turn the tide in the war to come. The Yellow Squadron was too late to save Stonehenge, but they engage with you regardless, possibly recognizing Mobius One's insignia. The music sets the stage once again. It's the same theme from when you had to retreat back in one of the earliest missions, but this time there's no option other than confrontation. Again to the radio. The way your teammates react with desperation helps to sell the scenario. It's during this fight the player can finally take down a Yellow. The game will reveal that it was actually Yellow 4, however, Thor's plane trails smoke through the air as Yellow 13 demands that she ejects. And then, after that, he asks his squad if anybody saw her escape. It's all but confirmed that she's dead. The kill feels almost unearned with the narrative context around it. Mobius 1, the other aircraft are withdrawing. That's a confirmed kill on a Yellow. It's a complete victory for the good guys. The narrator witnesses a moment of weakness for 13 as he holds Yellow 4's handkerchief. It's a rare glimpse into 13 from 13's own perspective. The way he blames Yellow 4 for going up injured with a plane in disrepair rings hollow. He likely knows that 4 going up was in order to protect someone that she cared for very dearly, because he begins to talk about how he'd met her when she was a child. These brief lines imply a deeper history than was suggested by the barkeep's daughter's jealousy. 13's morning is powerfully written for how understated it is. The metaphor from the beginning of the game of the ducks, which come up when the kid remembers his dead parents, returns. They seem to come up when characters reminisce on the dead. The breed doesn't seem to have a particular symbolism about that, but it's clearly used to re-evoke the feeling of loss. Without giving the viewer much time to stew, 13's back at his job. His best pilots are leaving to fill out other fronts, while he's got sunk with the rookies. The yellow unit looks in dire straits. You've turned the tide of war, but from this perspective, it only makes one pity 13 more and more. From this point on, this man who's been presented as a pure and legendary figure begins to only more deeply suffer. Yellow 13 gets his hands on an Allied news article and praises Mobius One's attack on Stonehenge. He sits alone in his usual chair. The shot seems designed to look notably empty without four by his side. He takes the opportunity to highly commend Mobius One's actions. All through the game, 13's been described as honouring his enemies, and that he would be disappointed if there weren't a strong opponent in the skies. He also takes a shot at whoever bombed their runway. The barkeep's daughter has blood on her hands here, she knows it. From here on, the cutscenes actually tell a multifaceted tragedy. All the pieces are in place. The key characters are a war orphan, trying to get revenge against a good man. A teenager who indirectly killed a decent woman in jealousy and now a legendary soldier who's lost one of his closest friends in the losing side of a war. This is in a stark contrast to the story of Mobius I from here on out.
The scenario is pushed towards the north end of the continent. That means there's a couple missions in a row with snowy weather and scenery, with even the Aurora Borealis making a showing. They're basic shooting missions which escalate from stationary to fast moving targets, and they find some non meaningful way to fit into the story. If you hadn't noticed, the main musical motifs of the game have become richer, with the bass lines getting thicker. The briefing gets more kick, mirroring Mobius 1's own development. It gives a good sense of forward momentum. It almost hides the real reason these missions are here is to stagger the game's events for the sake of good pacing, and to foreshadow a second super weapon in the game. Oh, you're at it, I guess it's a good chance to earn some more points for the end of game planes. The economy of the planes and their weapons is extremely lenient. You can sell your planes and ammo types for the exact same amount you paid, meaning you can effectively run on rent. Though the UI is really stylish, there's a major utility missing. You cannot compare currently purchased planes to unpurchased planes. The menus give a graph of the plane's proficiency instead of numerical statistics as well, meaning there's no intuitive way of knowing if you're buying a plane that's better than your current one. This should be where I bring up Yellow 13's and Mobius 1's canonical planes. Through the entirety of the game, and even named in your hood insignias, the Yellow Squadron fly the Russian Su-37. In real life, this was an experimental plane, first flown in 1996. It never saw active service. It was a heavy modification converted from the older aircraft Su-27M. At the time of the game's release in 2001, it was considered cutting-edge technology for its advanced electronic systems. The developing company, Sukhoi, even compared it to the Terminator. This is an irrelevant detail, but in 2002, the only plane of its kind, after extensive testing outside of its capability, a portion of its tail broke off. The pilot ejected from the plane, leaving it to fall, and it went down without ever finding a buyer. Now on the front cover, in concept art and advertisement material, Mobius One flies the F-22 Raptor, a plane thought to be the best of its kind. The final model, based on the YF-22 prototype, was first flown in 1996. Lockheed Martin had won the US competition to design a plane that would generate complete air superiority, and it was planned to enter service in 2004, which happens to be the year that the game takes place in. At the time of Ace Combat 4's release, the plane was still considered somewhat experimental, though it was finalised. Internal politics, the per unit cost, and continually more limited production figures began to make its formal adoption seem less and less likely. Again, irrelevant details, but it did indeed initiate active service in 2005, a year behind schedule. However, because of incredible cost, a lack of direct air-to-air -air combat from Russia and China, and because no other countries were nowhere near caught up with the air superiority, the F-22 was deemed overkill. In 2011, its production was halted and superseded by the inferior F-35 Lightning, which was cheaper and a bit more contemporary. No single F-22 was ever downed. In recorded simulated combat, a single plane was considered lost. The remaining 187 operational craft still see active service. In many ways, these two planes went on to be considered legendary by enthusiasts, and the question of F-22 versus Su-37 has been known to destroy friendships. If you felt like this section was irrelevant, that's just about how Mission 13 and 14 feel as well. With that short break from the story, we return to the narrator. Mobius 1 and ISAF push further north, and the town undergoes dramatic militarization as Aruja makes it a new front line. The city is in northwestern Uzia called San Salvacion. It bears more than a passing resemblance to France under German rule during World War II. Under the cover of night, the barkeep's daughter finds herself fleeing after trying to plant more bombs. Somehow the young lad managed to hide himself better than her, despite him opting to wear a high-vis jacket. Though she evades Erujan authorities, Thirteen himself confronts the girl, and he knows it was her who planted the bombs on his runway. There's a bit more subtext here because of what he admitted after Yellow 4's death. It is her fault that Yellow 4 died, but she's also just a girl like when he first met Yellow 4. The scene dwells on the moment before the narrator pops out of the shadows and points his pistol at Thirteen. Get out of our town, you fascist pig! Prior to this cutscene, the lad said he'd carefully considered the words he'd confront Yellow 13 with. Perhaps in the moment he'd chosen different words. Regardless, he chose poorly. They weren't words he believed in, and they weren't words that fit the situation at all. The Rouge aren't even fascist, but they were, perhaps, just as painful to 13 regardless. 13 simply asks if that's what they really thought. After all, 13 had given the lad a home, and gave the girl a means to live by. 
The days they shared didn't seem too miserable or sad in his eyes, but under the surface there were many unfortunate circumstances he did and didn't know about. He killed the lad's parents accidentally. He stole the young girl's heart. He was part of an occupation that fundamentally changed how they lived their lives, and a part of a war that took away their childhoods. Despite facing the barrel of a gun, Thirteen still remains in control of the situation, and they can only run when he tells them to. The narrator just lost his opportunity to declare his hatred, and his one true chance at revenge as well. And the girl's one-sided crush was unraveled directly by her own actions, the blood on her hands. It's a peculiar choice, but the director and staff chose to represent your opposition force with clear Nazi imagery. This was a conscious choice. The nation is characterized by its militarism and technological prowess. Also, the only head of state mentioned in the game is the supreme commander of their military. Assuming he's alone, perhaps mirroring how Hitler consolidated the powers in Germany. And yet, the circumstances aren't identical. It borrows imagery and the instantly understandable moral dynamic of Nazi-occupied France, and accompanying Nazi imagery, like other works at least, and then wears down the assumption that you have. Our quote-unquote Nazis are racially diverse. They have honor and respect. However, Iruja are canonically a federal republic, I've been avoiding referencing external materials, but part of the tensions leading up to the war was not only the Ulysses Comet that Stonehenge was built to combat, but also the Uzian refugee crisis caused by the natural disaster. Iruja couldn't support any more refugees, and they were condemned as anti-humanitarian. Refugee camps at their border were filled with crime and disease. To any European viewer, this game is pre-9-11. Iruja took nationalistic actions, however they weren't expansionary, nor were they racially motivated. I won't linger on the point, but it's common in the West today to say that nationalism is inherently immoral and racist. This isn't likely the view of the creators who were Japanese, a country filled with a strong sense of cultural unity and national identity, created through war and hardships with its neighbors. To compare with Iruja and its soldiers, the resistance is portrayed as cowardly. A child pulls a gun on an unarmed man to rescue his crush from a non-violent confrontation about how she killed a woman in cold blood and was ready to kill another. If Mobius I is a hero, who are the true villains? To complete this history lesson, the war began with Aruja's surprise invasion of San Salvacion, and the boy's home being lost to an explosion. This brings us to the 15th mission, the emancipation of San Salvacion. The resistance fighters, including Barkeep, halt the blackouts to aid visibility of ground targets for you. There's not only bogeys, but also optional yellows buzzing around, and they'll give you quite a chase if you aren't ready for them. It's a well-detailed map. The game uses the radio to elaborate on the narrative and gameplay. Occasionally, the local resistance radio crackles through, describing events from the ground. The music here is more slow-paced and a bit more reflective than other songs. This is where the war started, and it holds a solid place in the story of the game. The bar is somewhere down there, after all. And even the boy. Helicopters float between buildings, and there are plenty of ground targets, so you can actually get quite close to the ground, showing how both modern and somewhat classical it is. The town square resembles the Arc de Triomphe, complete with somewhat Nazi-looking banners. The events borrow from the liberation of Paris from Nazi rule, actually. The yellows here can be downed, though they're difficult to get a shot on. After taking out four or five, the fifth tries to leave the stage, and you can even give them chase. This is assumed to be Yellow 13. If you do chase and attack him, you might even get to see those famous sharp turns he makes, as he avoids every last missile you throw at him. He once held proud that he'd never lost a plane in his unit, and now even that's gone, if the player is proficient enough anyway. It's another example of how Mobius One's legend is largely in the player's hands. Many may not even know about how much is optional. You'd imagine this would be more important in the narrator's life. There's details about celebrations in the streets, and rounding up of remaining troops, a point's made of it and the boy and girl have gotten their liberty. And yet, instead, they follow their regrets and travel with the retreating erosions, looking for Yellow 13. Mission 16, Whiskey Corridor. This mission is uncomplicated, but it's not easy. The clusters of enemy tanks are tight with AA and SAM weaponry with buzzards flying around support overhead. And there's many bunker-type targets that take more than just one missile to crack. 
This means that you have to risk taking careful double shots at them by going slowly, making you easier prey to anything that can return fire. The desert sand dunes means that it's easier for enemies to hide than you. There's a lot of ways to die. It's difficult to put it into words, but the game truly does escalate in difficulty. Even on normal, it forces you to earn the heroic status that Mobius 1 has gained, and it does this mostly through target placement. Mission 17 for Banty is exactly one year after the first mission. Good luck to you all, and Mobius 1. An end to the war would be a nice birthday gift as well. Mobius 1. The final stand of the Erujian government. They've all but lost the war at this point, though they still have a looming super weapon in their midst. The music is fitting. It's the primary motif of the game put into a pounding orchestral rock hybrid of a soundtrack. Following the last mission's trend, the radio has calls of Mobius 1 is gonna get us through this, so stop whining. Mobius 1 isn't the only one here, you know. The game stresses parting a bridge to isolate movement from the ground troops, which is simple enough. At this point, something becomes truly clear. As you've approached closer and closer to the Erujian capital, there have been more and more craters. And they're even undeveloped upon. Outside of Arusia, there are man-made bays and structures built into the craters, no matter how devastating they were in location, or they're in otherwise nondescript landscapes. However, in Forbanti, the Arusian capital, a lot of the city has been sunk and pulled onto water by the meteor fragments, and it remains that way. No work has been made at all to rebuild the city. It's possibly because of a lack of resources. The war began because Arusia claimed it couldn't support more refugees. Perhaps there was some truth to it. The Supreme Commander of Arusia is found dead, with his wife and child sheltering nearby. The game seems to linger on this detail to show that the war is truly over. Once you've cleared the ground targets and the timer rolls down, it's finally time. The Yellow Squadron comes back for one last round, having fully rotated their members other than 13. He still puts up a hell of a fight though. This time, it's all or nothing. As always, their evasion tactics are supreme. There being a five-plane formation, it's very difficult to cover your tail, and the AI does seem to use its numbers to open you up, whether it's intentional design or not. As the hardest winnable air-to-air -air fight in the game, it's a great test of skill. It can almost feel unceremonious when you finally bag the last yellow, though. There's no fanfare, and there's no feedback. Yellow 4's handkerchief flutters down to the narrator and the barkeep's daughter, holding the dog Yellow 13 that saved earlier. It stresses the realistic setting, but the game's not shied away from such earnest and sincere happenings in the narrative so far. They both feel that it's only right to dig a grave for 13 and 4 using the cloth. It's either a sign of their guilt or their respect, probably a mixture of both. After all, each of them owes their lives to 13. In the barkeep's daughter burying the handkerchief for 13, she's accepting that 4 and 13 belong together. And it's perhaps a sign that she's accepted that what she did was wrong, as much as she can't make amends. For the narrator, it's a sign that he's accepted the death of those in his life. 13's emphasized to have disappeared into the sky. 13 did remind the child of his father. The same song they played together, and the one that his father played at the end of every day, hence the scene. In having the narrator's actions related to achieving his revenge be embarrassing and empty, it's revealed just how empty his plot was. You could read more into it and say the barkeep's daughter was a good warning for him. That our boy would create a grave for the killer of his parents shows that perhaps he has moved on from his bitterness, and ironically become more like how Thirteen felt for Four's death. Unconsolably upset, but no longer filled with hatred. After what should be the final victory, and after having defeated Arusia, a small cell of Arusian officers take over Megalith. The meteor falls left debris in orbit, and Megalith can shoot them down to Earth anywhere that it pleases. What sounds like distant explosions within the bunker underlies a briefing without music. The very thing that Stonehenge was created to prevent is now being forced. Megalith is currently acting, it seems. The island fortress happened to be shaped like a giant bird. You're informed that you must defeat Megalith from the inside. Unlike every other time you've chosen a plane to fly out, this time there's a rousing speech in the background about the importance of this final mission, putting the entire journey of Mobius 1 on the forefront. This is the final battle 
the final time to defeat the enemy that brought chaos to our continent. Megalith. Rex Tremende. The flames of hatred scorch the skies, igniting Gaia's funeral pyre. For this scene, I don't believe there are enough words to express my adoration in the world. So far, Mobius One has been put on quite a pedestal. But this mission outright compares him to Christ. The intro Rex Tremende takes from a 13th century Latin hymn, De Sere, or Day of Wrath. The original poem is from the perspective of humanity begging Christ for mercy during revelation and Christ's judgment on the world. The mission song Agnus Dei builds on this theme, named after a Catholic prayer with regards to Revelation. In a way, Mobius I is a person with tremendous power. He could put that power to any use, but he chooses to have mercy on the continent. This is how I believe the lyrics are meant to be interpreted, from the outsider's perspective, praying Mobius I's success to destroy Megalith. The idol role I mentioned all the way at the beginning, showing the heroic looking seagull as Mobius I, is finally re-referenced now showing the entire Mobius squadron as seagulls. From a certain perspective, the individual symbol of the hero becoming many shows that this isn't the experience of one pilot, but many. There are more people in the sky than Mobius I, and without these people, not even he could have turned the war. However, he is still the shepherd that ushered them all to this point. There is a reason that all the planes are ordered to follow Mobius I. The religious symbolism is taken even further, if that's even possible. Megalith's lasers are being cast into the sky continuously. Meteors, or stars to take from the initial cutscenes analogy, fall from the sky as in Revelations 6.13. You met with 15 optional yellows without 13, after a few seconds of flying anyway. Who these are is a mystery. Perhaps they're 13's ex-teammates who've been spread through the country. Perhaps they simply wear it to create fear, like a type of war paint. In the latter case, they're adorning the iconography of the hero, hoping it'll bring them luck in battle, as he was Aruja's Mobius One at some point. Regardless, they seem to deserve their status, they appear to have the AI of the boss squadron. If these enemies are skipped to the final objective, the entire Mobius squadron will be destroyed, and the yellows will gang up on the player. However, 15 yellows in 20 minutes is more of a daunting task than you might imagine. But, if Mobius One does join the fray, you can save every last one of them. An echoed electric drumbeat slams in the background, and the lyrics continue to roar. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Grant us peace. <laughs> the accompanying radio relays the ongoing operation from the land operatives infiltrating the facility, holding their own, waiting for someone anyone to disable Megalith's power generators. There are three routes to each one. Two through the bird's feet, and one by its wings. This is flying through a corridor. Though the game teased you with this in the valley flying segments, this is taken to the logical extreme. The spacing is so tight and precise you'll feel like a hero having accomplished it. The game adds more, possibly unintentional, tension by having the UI screen pull up and the notifications constantly being on screen. The targets have some differentiating architecture, which means that the left or center can be approached from either direction. After this, the music changes to a track named Heaven's Gate. The four missiles expose themselves and make themselves targets. It's very difficult to take out all four of them without preempting them. The one final larger missile hides within its own silo. One final corridor, and then that's game over. Mobius One survives the war, unarguably getting the grandest of send-offs that a nameless, voiceless protagonist could ever get. After having experienced one of the most disgustingly over-sincere scenes in any video game, the final cutscenes finally cut to the modern day, whenever that is. Our narrator gives us the context for our narrative, only in its closing statement. The cutscenes have been written as a letter to Mobius One to explain who Yellow 13 was, and to ask Mobius One whether or not 13 was happy being shot down. The question rings a little bit more deeply with the context of the final four months of his life after Yellow 4 was killed in action. They were probably the worst in his life. You'd imagine that the narrator, who knew him personally, would know this, 
but it's a very Japanese sentiment that only in battle can you tell so much about a person. The final still includes a photograph of 13, 4, the barkeep's daughter and the young narrator. He drinks the same drink that Yellow 13 could be seen within previous cutscenes, and he seems to have moved on to a larger harmonica. It's a comforting thought that he took a lot from those formative years, rather than wallowing in the horrors of war. The way that this context reframes the story shouldn't really be understated. In essence, the player's perspective could be argued to be from Mobius 1, reading through the letter. The playable mission sections are flashbacks to the formation of his heroic identity, only now learning about the story behind the villain of his story. I asked before, if Mobius 1 is a hero, who were the true villains? Ace Combat 4 came out during a time when games were taking advantage of what was quite a new and extreme dichotomy between cutscene and gameplay. There were some games which experimented with the fundamental structure of this dichotomy. It was always a consideration, but 3D rendering and CDs gave the creative teams the ability to create more content that was extremely limited in the player interaction. This includes things like scripted, pre-recorded polygon demos or full motion videos, more extremely guided gameplay sections as well. The way in which 3D worlds had given games an inherent mise-en-scene allowed otherwise boring things like realistic depictions of conversations to have their own entertainment value in building a world up. Returning to the point, the division of context in any game between gameplay and cutscene is effectively how much control the player has at the moment a cutscene giving the player zero control. Our narrator, through his entire story, has been part of a world that moves around him despite his best efforts. He couldn't save his parents, his life was drastically altered by occupation, he was too young to do anything for war efforts, and he never killed 13 and he couldn't get the girl. As if he were doomed from the start, full motion videos themselves have a definitive and fatalistic way of playing out. You can replay a cutscene a million times, but you'll never be able to change the outcome, unlike gameplay where the same mission can play very differently. The meta-narrative of his story is how fundamentally war can affect your life, creating prisoners of circumstance, and it promotes this even down to the presentation. It's from here that we can compare Mobius 1's story, one where at so many points you write your own story of his heroism through your own actions. There are large examples. Outside of 4 and 13's deaths, Every interaction with the Yellow Squadron has some implicit choice. You can still fight a losing battle, you can still catch a Yellow in Kamona. As Yellows become standard enemies, you get selection for bagging more. There's how many targets you destroy in the Aegir fleet. Then we can go to more subtle or meaningless examples. When it comes to ground targets, there are clusters that the game interprets as facilities. Destroying all targets within a cluster will have the game congratulate you. With the submarine base destroyed, all warships are pulled up inside. As a final example, the Mobius fleet with the Yellow Squadron during the final mission. There's many examples of the game giving you options to express Mobius 1's heroism that sometimes aren't even acknowledged by the game systematically. But they allow you to paint your own picture of Mobius 1 using your experience, by subtly influencing your perception of the scenario. Even when the game has faults like its friendly AI, it still plays them to the absolute strength of the narrative by pushing Mobius 1's legend further. But the game also themes the different factions. There's a general trend between Uzia and Erusia in that one relies on symbology of modern and theoretical sciences, and the other classical or proto-sciences. Isaf's logo is based on the Spinsky Fractal Triangle, more famously known as the Triforce or Hojo, except it replaces the triangles with radar icons for planes. Mobius 1's call sign and emblem, a Mobius band, is a one-sided shape not found in nature. And the number 1 is an absolutely unique number in many respects, because it's an abhorrently simplistic number. To compare, Eruja's flag is an aperture that surrounds seven stars. The aperture is better known today for being a component of camera lenses, but the technology was originally made for telescopes to filter how much light can be let through the lens, helping in the focusing process. It looks upon seven star constellation. The best I'm aware of is Pallades. The reason I'd think this is because Pallades was once used by historic man to judge the seasons, according to ancient writings anyway. And this fits with the theme of Stonehenge. 
The best theory of its existence is that it's a kind of circular shrine used to estimate seasons of the year according to the stars for the sake of crop farming. As for why I believe it's a telescope's aperture, it's because the major theme of stargazing is in the game. The stars fall from the skies, and the only named Erujian aces, save for 13 and 4, are all named after astronomers. These examples are only in New Game Plus, however. From Mission 1, there's Wang Zhenyi, and from Mission 7, there's Francisco De Vico, for example. As for Yellow 13 and 4, they're both suitably unlucky numbers, 13 being a Western number for bad luck for an unknown reason, and 4 being an Asian number for bad luck because it resembles the pronunciation of death, or Xi. To go further into numeracy, Eruja's Stonehenge has 8192, which is 2 to the 13, total computers split between 8 railguns. 8 is the Chinese number for good fortune, but in mission there's only 7, which perhaps coincidentally is a western number of fortune. The Yellow Squadron's alternative name is the 156th Tactical Fighter Wing Aquila, and their emblem features the Aquila constellation, which represents an eagle. 156? I have no reasonable assumption as to its significance. Here's a few more errant notes on the numerology, and there's patterns that I haven't really got any idea of. There's a few more powers of two. Yellow 1364 kill count that was first announced in the beginning, which is 2 to the 6. And each individual Stonehenge railgun having 1024 computers, which is 2 to the power 10. But I haven't quite gotten a decent theory on these. Through the game there's a large focus on circular geology and structures, namely the numerous craters in Stonehenge. It's simply a trend, I think. It may have been to show off the rendering power of the PlayStation 2 to create convincingly modelled circular structures, or it could have just been a coincidence. As for what all of these mean, there may well be very little meaning to glean from this other than the game's theming. Maybe Erujians look at the stars in the sky and the Uzians look to theory and concept. Without saying much, it subtly implies a kind of cultural distinction between the two otherwise interchangeable sides, without condemning one as outright evil. You can infer that Mobius I and Isaf are the new hotness, and that Erujia are stuck in the past. The close ties to seasonal star systems in Stonehenge could suggest that for the Erujians, times are changing. If there is a deeper meaning to the symbology, then I couldn't pass it. The theming is at the very least an excellent tool for telling the game's excellent story. I've heard criticism of post-4 Ace Combat style of storytelling, but the cutscenes and gameplay tell conflicting stories about War's terror, and War's joy, that they never meet head-on to hash out their differences. It's a criticism influenced by the Metal Gear-esque introspection. It's very popular among self-appointed game critics. My take on this is that they aren't irredeemable contradictions, but they're internally consistent, contrasting truths. Part of being a hero is accepting that you must kill good, honourable people. Fine men go out to die for their countries in meaningless wars, yet that doesn't make their actions meaningless. Both civilians and soldiers can be victims as well as instigators of great evil. Sometimes a lie can be made in good faith, and sometimes a lie can be made in bad faith. It's in this way that Ace Combat 4 builds up a complex morality and a natural ambivalence that makes it so human despite the otherwise very concise and dramatic narrative. With the moral conclusion being a still frame of an adult who fondly keeps a photograph of the man who killed his parents, nostalgically and gratefully asking the person who killed him if the thrill of battle had at least made Yellow 13 die a happy man. Even through the terrible things that may happen in our lives, we can reflect fondly on them for the simple joys despite their pain. Even through your own irreversible wrong decisions, in the end you can look back on the experiences with both regret and a smile. I began writing this not exactly knowing why Ace Combat 4 is held up so highly in my mind and heart. It's a great game, with snappy and involving play. It increases in complexity and difficulty. The story is entertaining and heartfelt, along with some fantastic 2000s Namco music. But I think that Ace Combat 4's secret may be that the whole is greater than the individual components. The game strides forward with an overwhelming confidence in what it believes that it is, and what it wants to say. It's written with the talent of ex-Ghibli staff in such a way that it satisfies a surface analysis, character analysis, and deeper reading, backed up by a fundamental understanding of the way that games are experienced by the player. 
I think what I've been trying to say this whole time is that Ace Combat 4 is a very well-made game, a good one, and that it deserves to be played and remembered.